Hello everyone, uh, welcome to another 42 Causes podcast. Uh, today I'm over the moon ridiculously excited to chat to Amani Duncan, who uh, we, we had a conversation a few weeks ago um, and I think it was supposed to be a 10 minute chat and we ended up talking for about an hour. So uh, really looking forward to this chat and thank you so much for joining us. For those who don't know who you are, I mean, obviously, if, if you're watching on a video, you can see that you're a multiple award winner because there's literally about a thousand awards and brilliant photos behind you. Um, but uh, for those of you who don't, um, but just because uh, you'll probably do a better job than me, what in a, in in a, in a few lines, like what 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 is it that you do? <laughs> and then uh, and then we what is it that I do? Gosh, um, first of all, thank you, Chris, for your generosity of spirit. I. I could talk to you for like days on end and our, and our spouses would be like, what is wrong with them? Like, but right. I just right. stimulate my mind and, and uh, I love your genuine curiosity. It's just so wonderful. Um, but hi everyone. My name is Imani Duncan and I am formerly the CEO of BBH USA, a, a little creative stri- strategic shop here in the, in the US. I'm sure many of you guys know of, of the BBH legacy. Um, and I'm currently advising and on the board of several blue chip companies and really enjoy that. Um, I'm a marketer at heart. And so I've spent the majority of my career in marketing functions, but in various industries. I yeah. now call myself a foreigner in foreign lands. Um, advertising has marked the fifth industry that I've successfully oh gone into um it's just i think it's part of my entrepreneurial spirit to and i I gravitate toward legacy beautiful legacy brands um so i've been in recorded music um you could probably see the beastie boys behind behind the book um you know i was in uh, the recorded music industry when i first left university and decided to not go into law and my parents yeah. have just now forgiven me for that decision, um, <laughs> but it was the right decision, I think. And so I blindly went into music, not even really knowing if you can yeah. make a legal, you know, honest living. But I, I did it and I spent about just under a decade at at some of the, the most iconic record labels uh, in the world. Def Jam. Yeah. Um, You're a and you were at Entertainment. Uh, I was, was like, that was, that was another phase. Yeah. So I stayed in entertain. I stayed in music for uh, about 10 years. And then I went into uh brand with uh, Sean Pump, which is chief marketing officer. And wow. I oversaw all, yeah, all six of his brands, which was like a dream job, especially for someone who has like an entrepreneurial spirit about them. Um, So yeah. that was fragrances and spirits and his TV film career and, uh, the fashion line and um, wow. reference and it just every day was a new opportunity to do something it was it was so exhilarating and then from there I did another big zag and went into manufacturing I uh, people still scratch their head about it like <laughs> what were you doing in manufacturing but when the oldest American guitar manufacturer called which is Martin Guitar you kind of pick up the phone and you you have that you know curious conversation with them which led to six glorious years of me running marketing they didn't have a marketing department before i started and so that gave me the white space to create uh what marketing looked like and felt like at a brand that at the time it was 178 years old when i joined um it was amazing and so the the proposition and how do you take a brand that's seeped in history and tradition and legacy that's 178 years old and remix it so that it appeals to a younger consumer without losing any of the brand equity? So we can talk yeah. about that forever. It was six and, um, um, amazing years. For me, out of interest, how I mean, you, you do hear about these companies every now and then that don't have marketing departments and they're yeah. ginormous. Um, yeah. And, I, and I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a bad or a, or a good thing. It's just a thing. But I heard actually a friend of mine was saying, I think Haribo, the, the German yeah. sweet manufacturer, they didn't have a MRP um, for, for, for years until uh, maybe five, six years ago. But when you mm. did that for Martin, how, 
how big was the company at that stage? Was it like hundreds, thousands of people? Yes. So there's, oh. yes, very much so. Yes. So there was two factories. They had a factory in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, which I mm. didn't know where that was. It's it's about mm. 60 miles from where I live in in uh, South Orange, New Jersey. Um, right. So it's not that far away, but it's a small town uh -huh. and it's quite lovely. And then they had a, a, a sister factory in Navajoa, Mexico. And so, you know, there was, yeah, it was over, gosh, in the Nazareth, in the Nazareth facility, there was probably 5,000 people. Um, right. So it was quite large. And then roughly around that number, give or take, in, in Mexico. And they right. were just, they were trying to reach a $100 million revenue bar. And I joined that year that they were trying to reach that mark. And I, I want to say through the enhanced marketing, um, <laughs> you were able to achieve that goal. Um, well, you know, it's interesting better. when you Brother. have companies that don't have, have market, it, they, sometimes they tend to mesh it with sales, which was mm -hmm. the paradigm at Martin Guitar. Um, but mm -hmm. it's funny, whenever I usually go into a company, it's mainly because the company needs a little help like they maybe they've lost their way maybe they need a refresh mm -hmm. um and that was mm -hmm. the case with with this beautiful heritage uh manufacturing company mm -hmm. they were losing market share to be quite honest to a very young upstart uh guitar manufacturer called taylor guitar My and, and, yeah and so they were losing market share and it was it's so interesting when you are in the eye of the storm it's really hard to to see things clearly. Um, so that's why when I come into company, especially being a foreigner in foreign land, I come in very fresh. I don't have any baggage. I don't have any, you know, I'm not tethered to anything. So I'm seeing things very clearly. And so for me, the reason why they were losing market share was very apparent. Um, and it wasn't so much that they didn't have marketing. It was just that the other company was talking to a demographic that they that Martin simply wasn't talking to. Right. That's all. Martin had a very core consumer, and they were kind of playing in the pocket. And so mm -hmm. my job was to remix that without losing any brand equity, because that would be like cutting your nose off in spite of your faith, but remixing it a little bit so that it did appeal to a very young consumer base. So it was quite the pendulum swing, um, yeah. but it worked. <laughs> I mean, bra bravo. Um, Thank you. I don't, all right, so I don't even know where to start because there's so many different places we could go in this so conversation. Many. But like, what I, I, what I love you, to like, do... After that, I went into, from Martin, I went into media so I went to Viacom, CBS, oh, yeah. and then after that, I ended up in advertising. I, I, I thought maybe a good place to start is like right at the beginning. You said that you you were supposed to go to um, go into law, was it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so how did you, you how did you get into your first role? Like, what was the mm. or, or, what how did it all start because i mean it, it seems like throughout there's always been a thread if i look at your sort of digital cv and from from what you've been been telling me in our chats there is a thread of kind of music and entertainment like it is did this start from a young age like when you were growing up we like oh like i want to work in that industry one day or like how yeah how did it come about yeah so um Going all the way back to my youth, um, I grew up in a very musical household. I right. was told that at a very young age, around four or five, I walked to my family, walked up to my family's piano, and I started plucking out melody. Um, um, my my dad, God rest his soul, um, he was a musician by by love. He was an electrical engineer by trade, a musician, right. jazz musician by by love. Right. And so he played every instrument. Our house was constantly filled with music. Um, my dad played the piano. He His true love was the flute, so he really dedicated his life to being a flautist. My mom played guitar, a Martin guitar. Um, my sister played <laughs> violin, and I played piano. And so we, we always grew up in a very musical household. My We listened to the, you know, we, did, we weren't allowed to listen to the radio growing up, but we listened to records. 
Um, and so our house was constantly filled with some form of music, whether it was on the record player or whether it was us kind of all playing together. And so that was always core to who I was, who my family is. But I never thought about a career in, in music. Um, you know, early on, they thought I was going to be a classical pianist. I went to a conservatory, the whole nine, but it wasn't my love, love. I just enjoyed playing the piano. I was a political science major. So I, I was in very speech and debate in very different. So I was mm -hmm. an academic. I was, you know, I excelled in school. I was on the speech right. debate team, winning tons of awards, um, really just loving it. And I went to university and I was a political science major with a minor in international relations. I thought wow. I would go on, get a law degree and then work abroad, you know, perhaps for yeah. the UN or be an ambassador or something. So I, I just really was on a very different track. But what happened is what, once I graduated from university, I, I had a, a pause. I had a moment. It was quite scary and upsetting to everyone in my family, basically. But for me, it was scary in the sense that I, for the first time in my, in my very young life, I was questioning, was this the path I wanted to take? Or was this a path that was simply told to me over and over again throughout right. my life? And, uh, I asked my parents for a reprieve. I just said, I, I need a moment. I need a moment to just think and pause. And, you know, it was tumultuous. It was all this drama. But they allowed me to defer. And my mom was very adamant that if I deferred, I would never go back. I would never even go. And she was right. But then here's young Amani sitting on her parents' couch, miserable, stressed out because I didn't know what to do. I never, I literally was a one track mind person. I didn't even know what I, what I liked. And so one day I woke up and I said, I'm going to work in the music industry. What, what was it? My mom's like, she was a lunatic. Was there something that made you, you said that you, you paused, like, was it, was it, was the pause just because you, you, you suddenly realized you didn't want to go down the path that, that you sort of had kind of been predetermined for you. And like, yes, was, was it just as simple as that? Um, or, it was, yeah. you know, if I think back, I mean, it's been many years, mm -hmm. but uh, if I think back on it, it, it was the, when I was going through the process of applying to law school and like, it became very real. Uh, right. And right. I just, I, I just remember just asking myself, is this really something I want to do? It was just that simple. And yeah. when the answer back wasn't an immediate, yes, of course, that's when all hell broke. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was just like and then, madness. So then, then you decided, right, I'm going to go down the music path. Uh, yeah. I just woke up one day for no random reason. And I said, I'm going to work in the music industry. And my mother was like calling the therapist, like she's completely lost. And I, and I remember getting the yellow pages, like, you know, kids, wow. the directory that's not online. <laughs> and I flipped to record, literally record company. I flipped to that page. And the first, the first one I saw was Def Jam. They had a tiny little west coast office and i called the number and this woman picked up the phone i went into my speech you know i'm a recent college grad and i'm looking for an internship and she said show up tomorrow and hung up unbeknownst to me the woman who answered the phone was the svp of a and r for the west coast office tina davis and she's gone on to manage you know, she had an illustrious, she had the illustrious career. She went on to manage Chris Brown and other artists. And she's currently at Empire Records right now. She's amazing. And I showed up and the rest is history. I, I interned for her. I learned, I was a student. I was just voracious. I, I was like, this is awesome. And I, wow. you know, I was dealing with the contracts that I was dealing with transcribing lyrics by hip hop artists that I was like, ah, this is crazy. Wow. 
and uh but i learned everything and they always told me i couldn't they weren't gonna hire me and i was like okay and after three months i was like i need a job so i had all these interviews lined up at record companies because i was like i like this i think i'm gonna stay with them and yeah. they were like wait no you can't leave we you're amazing uh -huh. and so they found me a job and not a job i wanted but it was office manager of five people i was like okay i'll take it and then i proceeded to create my own job and nice. unbeknownst to me it was what promotions manager did and i was like what is a promotion manager i don't even know what that is and i got on the radar of some really important people like kevin lyles and julie greenwald who's the chairwoman of uh, atlantic mm -hmm. records and leor cohen uh who's now head of youtube music and i just did good work for them and then i would say shortly thereafter they offered me a job in new york and moved me over a weekend so it's i mean i never thought about that is you, you yeah i think it and it's so key for so many people starting is is often the biggest the biggest obstacle to doing great things is normally yourself not other yes. people and i love the way that you just opened up a book and you're like here's Jeff, def jam records i'd imagine that def jam even back then was still huge right it's like you you were oh, in like massive yeah, you, I, massive yeah and, and so you're just like well screw it let me just give them a call and and then uh, and then i mean with life, there's always a little bit of lucky timing. It sounds like you got in you know, with a really lovely lady who helped mentor you, and then and then you worked hard and made yourself irreplaceable, which then meant they had to hire you. <laughs> of course, they're going to hire you. Um, it, yes. it's it, it when you say it like that, it sounds so easy. I think mm -hmm. most people tend to overcomplicate it, um, and uh, they do. And, and I think they. Do. they maybe then go and try go down the, the path that they think they should take rather than, than the one they want. So I, I'm imagining if you had gone down the traditional route, perhaps you wouldn't have had the same energy putting into that job. Um, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's incredible. So you, anyway, sorry. So I, I'm, I'm going off. No, thank I, you. No, thank I'm, you. Yeah. I, I, it's so inspirational, the, the story. And then from, from there, did it, it, was it just a kind of natural progression into other music companies or? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, um, they called me on a Friday and Kevin Lyles did and said, I'd have a job for you in New York, but you need to be here Monday. So but, I went home and packed up my little belongings and you know, the other route back. Time, are you? <laughs> no, but I, you know, honestly, Chris, I felt like, I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Like yeah. I was like, I'm young. Yeah. I can always come back home if it doesn't work. And right. I, you know, I feel very blessed because I had parents who instilled in my sister and I this sense of fair fairness, fearlessness mm -hmm. that we could be mm -hmm. anything, anything that we wanted to be and go for it. And so I did. It was scary as heck because I didn't know anyone in New York and except for Kevin and he wasn't much help. And I lived in a hotel for three months and it was horrible. I know it sounds glamorous, but after, you know, three weeks, it becomes the walls start yeah. closing in on people. Right. But I loved what I was doing. And it was at the, you know, early 90s and it was at the height of hip hop. And we had Jay Z and DMX and oh my gosh, we had LL Cool J and the most amazing artist uh, ever. And so it was just an exhilarating time to be in New York City at the, like, just when hip hop was just yeah. cranking on all cylinders. And so then, you know, like it is today, the merging of the labels started. And so we merged with Island Records, became Island Def Jam. And then right. uh, I eventually left to go once again to a legacy band <laughs> that needed a little help. So Virgin Records called and wow. they were going through a huge transition, huge transition. And they had let go of pretty much everyone, and they were bringing in what they called a turnaround team. And so I had built quite um, a nice reputation for myself. So I was tapped to come over to lead video production and promotion at this new, wow. you know, under this new regime at Virgin Records. And so I stayed there for quite some time. Eventually, we merged with Capital Records, becoming Capital Music Group. 
and I ended my tenure there with eight years. And oh wow, that's awesome. around wait, what's eight years? Let me think. It was two thousand. It was two, yeah, eight years. I left in in two thousand eight. Right. Um, and I ended my career there as the senior vice president of marketing for the pop rock side. So I had transitioned from hip hop to, to eventually doing the entire roster, all genres at a major record company. And I'm very proud of that staff because when that had happened back at Def Jam, I was one of three mm. black people that did the entire roster at a wow. major record company. So I was very wow. proud of like being part of that, that, um, <laughs> but that changed. And so I ended at, I ended at Capital Music Group. We launched Katy Perry. We had 30 Seconds to Mars with Jared Leto. We launched Coldplay's Vida La Vida, or Viva La wow. Vida. I get that mixed yeah. up. Um, Vida, Viva La Vida. Uh, and just <laughs> Rolling Stone and like Iggy Pop. And, wow. and, and just on Lenny Kravitz, who's a dear friend, um, launched his, gosh, was it the 12th studio album? I mean, it was just- wow. And Gorillas, which was the joy of my life, working with Damon Albarn and uh, with Danger Mouth. And so I met there. And when I did, um, it was on a high, but um, I went over to Charlotte. I became his chief marketing officer. So again, another, uh, still with an entertainment underlay, but went over to straight brand. How, how did you, I mean, well, one, a, a very quick question. Um, you, you saying that you sort of worked in, in the, um, hip hop world, and then there was the kind of rock music world. From those two genres, who are the who are the two like who are your two favorites? Like the people you had to work with. <laughs> you know, it's so but, funny. Um, artists are artists. Um, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't even matter the job. You know, I I right. the funny thing is, I when I decided to move into more of the of the rock and the pop side, it was. It was mainly because I grew up listening to all types of music. So I was like, right. I love all types of music. I love country music. Like, you know, yep. my household, we listened to everything. And I um, was kind of bored because I was doing visual, I was doing video production and promotion. So I got a little bored with what the hip hop artists were doing. You know, it was all formulaic. It was, it was a right. bit misogynistic, you know, to say the least. And I was just like, yeah. I don't want to be a part of that. I need. I need, yeah. I need us to do some real creativity. You know, I remember trying to push Jane Z and trying to push artists into like doing something different with their visual. Um, mm -hmm. Jay, who I'm so proud of. I mean, he definitely spread his wing, wings over the years. I mean, 99 problems was a, mm -hmm. I would have loved to have produced that work, you know, that, that, that visual, um, because that's the kind of like game changing yeah. rock, pop, hip hop, you know, with black and white. And yeah. it's just like, it was so it was so disruptive and amazing um so you know i i did love working with the rock artists you know i i, I getting to meet you know bon jovi getting to meet melissa etheridge you know hanging out with Iggy pop you know and and meeting the stones i mean that i was like what like this is you know this is amazing you know and lenny and right. like becoming really good friends with them you know but i have to say regardless yeah. of the genre they're all the same <laughs> we have right. they make right. you know they're difficult they're, they're challenging yeah. but they're no they're no more difficult than working with a client or working with yeah. a creative director because i always say yeah. creative directors are rock stars you know so it's all the same people are people yeah. you gotta learn the right. formula and you know but so i think high, highly creative people are not always university, but they, they do tend to be a bit quirky, a bit, a, a bit, you know, not necessarily difficult it. to work with, but there's definitely, you've got to, you've got to know how to work with them to get the best out of them. That's a powerful way of saying that. Yes. How, how did you go? Thanks. How did you go from, um, you know, sort of, how did you get into the branding and marketing side of things? So again, cause I mean, that you you were saying at, at university there was a lot of stuff around communications and you thought that you might be an ambassador or something for the UN. That, I mean, there, there's there's a lot of intersection, I guess, with branding and marketing with that. I mean, it's all ultimately communications. So, Absolutely. Was that, 
how did you get into that side of the business yeah. was it kind of oh by the way can you go and do this for this and then you're like uh yeah why not like what, what happened well you know a lot of i mean listen there was no rule book when for what right. we're doing in the music industry um it became right. more more corporate it became more and more business um and so i always kind of leaned more on the business side and understanding that um especially because when we when we were doing music videos at the height of music videos i mean our budgets were five six seven ten million dollars right. and i'm managing wow. that you know so wow. like it it was an obscene amount of money we were doing many films we were doing short yeah. films uh, because music videos became longer and longer and longer um and then we started doing breath because we needed when when things started to go on the downside we needed to subsidize these big budgets whether they were uh specifically for video and that's why you started seeing more product integration or whether it was to subsidize your marketing budget so um right. as this as senior vice president of marketing for capital music group we were it was at a time this was um early 2000s and it was at a time where things are a little stagnant for us and we just didn't have the big marketing budget that a lot of our heritage artists were used to having so we had to get more scrappy we had to get way more creative and so i put a mandate and i said to my marketing team and really to the organization at large i said artists are brands we have to shift how we think about this talent they are really brand like lenny kravitz has curated his brand for years for decades mm -hmm. so we have to shift the way we think of them and so i i also said financially we need to start doing some more strategic partnerships uh but they need to be rooted in authenticity they can't mm -hmm. feel like where did that just come from um so i challenged the team by saying every new artist for their album release project we need to have at least one at least one brand associated with this with this project for heritage wow. artists we need at least three or more so wow. that really started our reshaping which is now i mean there's departments at record companies that yeah. do this there's three they're called strategic partnership uh, departments. And so I said, we really need to reshape how we think about AR talent. Talent is now a brand. And then we need to bring in smart partners to help offset marketing spent. Uh, yeah. So for example, with Lenny Kravitz, I had his, um, I think it was his 10th studio album, if I'm correct. It's time for a love revolution. And you know, Lenny's a, a, was a heritage artist for his records, and he was used to big budgets. And so I had a conversation with him, and I said, "Listen, I need you to trust me. I, I, we're going, we're going to need to bring in some really smart partners. I promise you, that they will be authentic to your brain. But this needs yeah. to happen." And he was like, "No, no, no!" And eventually, I got him to agree. And so I did purchase the Levi's. We did a custom line of uh lenny kravitz design levi's because lenny is always Levi's, wow. that we sold through kohl's we brought in myspace believe it or not at the time wow we brought in back in the West day airline yeah yeah <laughs> so that's really when i when i got the bug for the brand side of things mm -hmm. um so going from the, you know the record company side to overseeing all six of his brand uh sean's brand mm -hmm. and, and his partnerships it was kind of a natural uh transition i have to pause and just say for two seconds when people look at my cv which i now call a career portfolio it's too live it's too dynamic to be a just a cv um, yeah. so when i was making these moves people were scratching their head they were like right what is she doing this literally does not make sense but it makes yeah. perfect sense to me because I, yeah. because I, I never, I realized early in my career in the record business, how people want to brand you, how people mm. want to put you in a pocket, like, oh, you're this, that person. I didn't want mm. to be known as the music, the record label. Not like there's anything wrong with that. I still have a ton of friends who are thriving 
uh, in abundance in the record business. But I, I didn't want that for myself. I wanted to right. simply be known as a very smart business woman. And right. so curiosity, being curious, just like Yelna Mani, who looked in the yellow pages and found record company, that spirit has followed me throughout my entire career. And if I wasn't curious, um, I wouldn't have gone into the industries that I've gone into um, and learned how to be a successful foreigner in foreign land. So I just I just felt like I needed to underscore that for everyone that's listening because someone might be having the same, you know, questions or challenges. Uh, I think I well, think it's so there was a bit that you said earlier about about the the sort of fearlessness that would in, installed in you by your parents. And I thought the you know, I probably uh, there was some similar when we were last chatting, I was explaining I've also had a weird, very weird non standard career uh life um and and something you said resonated with me was that um you know the in you were saying that you you thought well what what's the worst that can happen is i i end up at my parents and you know i quite i quite like them so it's not it's not a terrible thing and i think it's reframing some of these things when you are taking a step um and just going well what's the worst can happen you know i end up at my parents and i have to kind of go back into something else i mean that's not a terrible thing and then the but the potential upside of the other thing does work which you know normally if you put effort into it as is showing you you did normally amazing things can happen um it's fantastic and uh and so incredible that you got to meet with so many people and also i love the way that you you said that you framed it quite simply if, if you're a new artists they need to have at least one brand working them with them if they're a legacy artist they need at least three uh so um and and that it needed to be done with you know an, a genuine fit so that it uh it really works and I, I i i think that's that's kind of key isn't it if you if, if, if as long as you as long as you get the the, the fit right then uh, then everything's fine but otherwise then it otherwise it turns into a nightmare but uh, so was was it after this did you did you go did you stay in music some more um or how like because eventually at some stage you get into advertising into an actual advertising agency um which is very different quite uh, it's quite remarkable i mean luck luck has served me very well um mm. and and i feel very blessed to even say that you know when i went to I've always loved creativity and I've always stayed very close to the maker um right it, you know I consider myself a creative I mean there's times I'm sitting there reviewing you know storyboards and scripts and um I feel very blessed to have had um you know a foundation in the visual art you know by making the, the music videos and the short films and you know even at Martin Guitar I went on to produce executive produce a, a, a documentary that went on and won countless film uh film festival awards but yeah. i i rooted myself in both sides so i can use the left side of my brain and the right side of my brain and so i always mm -hmm. wanted to stay close to the makers when i went over to mm -hmm. sean um one of the one of the brands i oversaw was his record uh uh label uh, business and or his record recorded music career um, it started out with my friends at Atlanta. This is children, Puff, Puff Daddy. Puff right. Daddy, yes. Puff yeah. Daddy, yes. Yeah. All of the money. You can't just name drop Sean and ex I, I, <laughs> Yeah, I I was one of the few people that just called him Sean. I was like, I have to call him <laughs> Sean. God-given name. Um, right. Love him. And so, <laughs> he, you know, he was with Atlantic and then he, he went over to Interscope. And that was one of the things that I would oversee as well. But there was a full team, full team. So I was just kind of on the top of it, kind of looking down, making sure uh, everything stayed on track. But he had a in-house agency called Blue Flame. Wow. And they were, they were really just an agency that worked on whatever projects he was working on, whether it was for I Am King fragrance law, launch or with uh, Diageo for you know, the launch of a new Syrah flavor. I mean, that's kind of what they did. But I wanted the agency to grow. And so I said, well, we need to become a pitching agency. Like we actually need to pitch for new business. And uh, 
created that and brought in some really smart thinkers, some really smart creative. Um, one of them was Shannon Washington, who's now the uh, chief creative officer over at RGA here in the States. Um, and she does have a global remit as well. And so we started pitching. Um, and then from that, I joined the ABC Global Board. Um, and I, you know, agency life was always kind of circling me. When I was always the client, I was forever the client. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, just the jump to advertising quickly, I, I think that was one of my, I know being, I should speak in more affirmative. I know that's one of my superpowers because I'm a client whisperer. Right. The clients that we, all the new business that we were able to garner at BBH USA, I had a hand in bringing them in. And I think it was for the first time they had someone that truly understood the the pain point. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I laid in bed wide awake staring at the with the chessboard on the ceiling, trying to figure it out, um, figure out the next move, you know? And so yeah. when I would say to my, my clients who became friends, what keeps you up at night? Talk to me. Mm -hmm. And they felt like they were talking with an ally. It wasn't just yeah. the one who was trying to get a piece of business I, because I, less than two years ago, I, I was in your seat. I was right there with you. So there was a heightened sense of empathy um, and just, just understanding, you know, I mean, my clients would call me in the middle of the night and we would problem solve. We would, we would work it out. And they knew that if I, if I said I was going to do something, I would do it. And if I said I couldn't do something, I just, you know, I just, I just believed in living, you know, leading with a heightened level of transparency and honesty. So going back to Sean, it was, it feels like kind of a head scratch, but I think a lot of people didn't know that there was blue flame. There was an in-house agency that I was overseeing. So I still had one foot in mm. the brand side and then one foot in the agency side. So it wasn't that much of a leap of faith. Yeah. It sounds like you love, uh, you love being close to where the stuff's been made, which oh, yeah. I guess then may, it helps explain why you, you sort of then dove into the, the, the sort of the agency world. I mean, it's, it's it's uh it's perhaps not as um profitable i don't know what the right words to say but it's, it's definitely more exciting um it, it's uh yeah i mean it just generally in life the, the, you know the closer you are to the money the the, the more your margins generally speaking um yeah. so i think when when you go when you do go to to the agency side i mean i'm, I'm not saying that they're necessarily struggling with money but it, it it is you normally have to think a bit bit smarter so you don't have quite so much wiggle room as when you are the brand yourself generally Absolutely. speaking um well you're there you're right on what when when you you know when you joined bbh um was that after mm -hmm. after sean then um no was this, no no this, there's a few more right. in between there believe it or not i know i know i wasn't done yet I wasn't done. So when I left Sean, <laughs> um, cause curiosity just got me once again, it, it, uh, my life, my life, I, uh, I'll never forget, Chris, I was sitting in the big corner office, you know, right at Times Square and the phone rang and I picked up and it was a recruiter and I'm, you know, I'm always surprised when recruiters get my number, I'm like, is it listed somewhere? <laughs> like, oh my God, I need to take it down. Um, yeah. and it was this, this amazing recruiter who's become such a good friend. And he nice. said, I found your information and I'm like, how, <laughs> but okay. Mm. And he said, I have an opportunity. I would love to talk to you about, but don't hang up the phone. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> he goes, it's for, it's with Martin guitar. And of course my mom plays oh. Martin. Every, every artist, their shops plays a Martin. It's like, come on, you know? And I was like, keep talking. Like, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at this point. Like, they're looking to start a marketing department. They're looking for a head of marketing. I'm like, okay. He's like, but don't hang up. I'm like, okay. He's like, it's in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. I'm like, the first place of price? Like, what are you talking about? Like, where's Ron? Where's Nazareth, Pennsylvania? I'm like, what are you talking about? And curiosity got me. And I 
went and visited the factory. I mean, I I think people don't realize, like, I didn't work in an office. I worked in a working factory with blue yeah. other work. So just another another tool to add to the toolbox. It's rusty. It's another, but it's another, another way that you got closer to the creators again um, as well. The makers. The maker. Yeah. I, my first yeah. year at Martin, people would say, they, if they were looking for me, they were like, oh, she's on the factory floor. I mean, I said, <laughs> every, I mean, I was just, I was in awe of yeah. luthiers. I mean, Martin still does so much by hand in the construction mm -hmm. of, a, of a guitar. And, you know, there's only a few things that are automated. And these instruments are world renowned. And it was, I was just, I was so curious about the process, but also the people, you know, because right. you have multi-generational workers at work. You know, you would see the son and then his mom and then his dad and then his grandmother and his uncle and his aunt. Like, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And, you know, you walk into the factory and, oh, I, I will never get over that smell of mahogany and wood. Oh. It's, it was just intoxicating. I mean, I stayed there for six years. I, I loved what? it more than I even could imagine. And it still reaps benefits. I sit on the board of Fender Guitars because I firmly believe because of um, the fact that I, you know, not only did I tick the boxes of the remit for the board seat, I mean, how many times are you going to find a black woman <laughs> CEO? <laughs> Who worked at the cleaning yeah. guitar manufacturer of yeah. acoustic guitars? I mean, like, I'm a unicorn, so you know it was yeah, a little really experience. Yeah, it was, and, it was and amazing. knows all the and knows all the musicians <laughs> and yeah, and all the musicians. Yeah. But this time, I got yeah. to like work with some of the most amazing people, like you know Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Oh, God rest his soul, wow. David Crosby. Mm -hmm. Um, you know Roseanne Cash. Um, Jason Isbell, mm -hmm. Virgil Simpson, the Avid Brothers, like, I mean, it was just mind-boggling, the artists that I got to work with and bring them on as Martin Ambassador and share it, like, sweetheart, you know, yeah. brought him on board and it was great. We we need to know your Spotify username uh, so we can we can follow. I mean, I, I'd imagine it's massively eclectic. I, I want I want all your playlists. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, yeah. it's like Miles Davis to like, yeah, I don't know. To I'm so yeah. keen. That, that's my so, high weekend sorted. I just need to find Marnie's <laughs> playlist on Spotify, and then I'm done. Uh, um, <laughs> it'll stick to a genre, you know. And then from there, right. I went to you know media on the, the fourth. Industry. Right. Um, I just went to Viacom. Yes, off at Viacom. Viacom. Um, and then became Viacom CBS, obviously, and right. with the merger. And I oversaw, you know, music it, for MTV and VH1 and, and all the channels. I mean, it was incredible. Um, but, and then... An MTV oh, award. This had an MTV award behind you. Yeah. It? Yeah, but I have a few. I have a few moon persons. We call them moon persons. Of course you have a few. Um, <laughs> and I have a few because I... One of the things was I executive produced um, several VMAs, um, which is which wow. lovely. Um, so I have a few of these. Um, so, you know, the good thing is that, again, staying close to the makers, you know, was able yeah. to put on my EP hat again and really transform what the VMAs, the Video Music Awards and the, in the European Music Awards, just transform what it meant for not only the viewers, was we did some really bold partnerships, digital partnerships, um, but it also, you know, changed what it meant to the artists and to the record labels and to the managers. Mm -hmm. um, people started, uh, you know, tying their album releases once again to the VMAs. Um, you know, we had for the first time a Spanish language performer, which was Maluma, for the first time. It was just crazy. Um, had J Lo as the video vanguard, had Missy Elliott at the video vanguard um, one year. Love it. Just really, really had some fun. But again, always stay close to the work. I, I, I need to stay close to the creed, the makers. 
<laughs> that brings me joy. And then COVID has. That's <laughs> crazy. And then, and then you when you joined BBH, if I remember rightly, it, it was um, it was not in a good space. Uh, so it sounds like again, you you know, there's a similar a similarity in that often you're brought in to you know problem solve a a, a, a sort of a, a maybe a very famous brand, but one that's that's in trouble. Um, and 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 I can see you know even just on this call, hopefully anyone who's listening, you can kind of get a sense that you, you your energy levels are, are sort of you know at least twenty thousand out of ten. Um, so it's <laughs> It, you, you do, I can get a sense that you take it to a million or dial it up to eleven. Um, it, it, it it's amazing. And you and and that I mean that that's sort of I guess how you got into the into the can lion side of things. I mean mm. when I um when when I when I first sort of met you or I don't even know whether we got to chat, but when I first saw you, it was because it was you were a jury president um of uh, of entertainment and music at, at lions um yeah last year in 2022 that's right yeah. i've got my years right um <laughs> and you picked some amazing stuff there i mean i i'm probably going to flirt through very quickly bbh roles because what i one of the other reasons why i really thought it'd be lovely to chat is there are so many people who listen to this podcast who who enter awards who would love to enter awards maybe haven't found success yet and you you've been a, a, a jury member at lions and a bunch of other award shows mm -hmm. um you're currently a, just found out a double president of dubai lips <laughs> just like the the, <laughs> the uh the, the 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 local it's kind of almost like a sub sub brand of can lions but for uh for the middle east um and and so you yeah you you've got to judge work in in lots of different ways and how you know what are some of the are there some general things that that people should do or not do or um as sort of some general advice well first of all thank you so much um <laughs> for this i'm having the, the best time um and uh the honor's mine judging. i do like judging um i do i i um I had the pleasure, and I have one, one little one of my can lions behind me. But I had the pleasure of yeah. judging. Oh, it's just so. I mean, can is just such a game changer. Um, it was a game changer for us at BBH as well. I had the pleasure and the privilege of judging the 2020 and 2021 can lions for uh, entertainment for music with Wyclef John, who was the jury president. Um, and that was that was a very healthy um, time because mm -hmm. we were judging two years worth of work. It was, mm -hmm. it was very, very yeah. intense and very intense. Um, and then again, they, then they asked me to come back as jury president for the same award category, uh, Entertainment for Music for 2022. And then this year, I'm I'm heading yeah. to Dubai. So I'm very excited. Um, one thing that I always tell the juries. At the beginning of the process, is there's not there's no better indicator than your gut. If right. there is work that you see that you're like, oh, God, why didn't we do this? Or work that just shell us up, you know? <laughs> that's that's work that you should probably put over in this like good box, you know? Like oh, right, because that will there's nothing better than your gut. I mean. The Grand Prix that we awarded last year for Entertainment for Music was it it was literally the upset of the of the of the awards because no one saw it coming. It was just a piece mm. of work that emotionally like we were just so tethered to it. It beat out all the usual suspects, mm. the little Nas X and the Beyonce's and mm. and this was this like not low budget, but compared to all the big yeah. budgets, you know, huh, projects that we were looking at, this wasn't even close, you know, but yeah. it was impactful and it was urgent and it was timely and it needed to be highlighted. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I say that to kind of give everyone a piece of advice, which is two things. Be 
we see a lot of work that is just in every category mm. and it doesn't make sense. So it's just mm. quickly dismissed. We're just like, they don't even meet the criteria. Like right. my, my first recommendation is be very thoughtful and intentional around your submission. A, it mm. will save you money and B, <laughs> it will increase your chances of actually possibly making the coveted shortlist and then maybe even a medal. Um, yeah. B, just don't randomly enter. It doesn't serve you. Qu quantity is not quality. Um, so that's my first piece of advice. And the second piece of advice is, you know, make the work appealing. Um, mm -hmm. To my point, the Grand Prix, which was This Is Not America um, for Entertainment for Music last year, it was not anything that we saw coming. It was... Mm -hmm. It stunned us. We spent hours debating this one piece of work. And that is the beauty of Anne Lyon. <laughs> that is what we hope to get. That is like to have those robust and provocative and exciting conversations around a piece of work that just stumped you. You were just like, where did this come from? I'm like, oh my God. Like, I literally left one day of judging. <laughs> where we locked in the short list, thinking that this piece of work, even though we talked about it, I was convinced we were going in a different direction. And so I even started like kind of writing out my notes and my quote. Well, I was so convinced we were going in a different direction. And then the next morning I show up in, t in the jury room where we're, this was the day we're awarding medal. So it's a very intense, it's all business, all jokes aside, I'm running it tight. I'm like, this is, we can't make mistakes because this is a Ken Lyon, you know, and then we're going to do the Grand Prix. Like, this is the Oscar. So, it, you know, we got to be serious. And when that piece of work rose, I, I, I had to stop. I said, I, can't, I said, first of all, I can't believe we're going to be this bold. I can't believe we're actually going there. And I was, I, at that moment, I could not have been more proud of my jury. I had a killer jury. I sure. was just like a proud mama. So my second piece of key advice is make the work, give us FOMO. Make us jealous that we didn't make this piece of work ourselves, you know, because these award shows, the world is watching. CMOs, the industry, the work that is on the short list and actually is awarded a medal, we are setting the tone and tenor for the subsequent year. We are literally putting our stamp of approval on this body of work saying, this is what, this is excellent. And mm -hmm. this is what we expect to see. And then some in subsequent years. So the bar is set. Let's see next year who's gonna top who's gonna top it. And so that's the Thank that's you. why I love judging. Yeah, I think there were there were two interesting things that that I took from that. One was um one was that oh, I guess it's worth everyone knowing that when you're a jury president you actually don't have a vote unless there's a I tie, I think. Uh, so yeah. uh, so that's probably yeah. why you're saying you're so surprised because you, you you're actually not allowed to to debate yourself um and the second thing was and i thought that was interesting it's something we were actually talking about before we started the recording was how awards actually can be a great motivator for teams and and just to help point your agency or your company in a, in a certain direction because i think you were telling me a story about um i think it was actually entering the webbies uh um for, for bbh but um is it possible to just talk quickly about that? Um, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, it, listen, you make, you, you try every project, you try to make the best work possible. You know, know. we don't, right. we at BBH, we didn't go into projects saying this was going to win an award or that was going to win. Yeah, I, we just, we just really wanted to make like the best work possible. But for any agency, big or small, 
to win any award, especially a can light, can be a, such a defining moment for the trajectory mm. of an agency. It can either, you know, if it's a small startup, it can like set you on the winning track for new business and new work. If you're an established agency, it could still show that you're fresh and that you're urgent and that you're delivering award-winning work for your client. So regardless of where you are in the stage of your experience at an agency, it can just reap such great benefits. It definitely did for us. Uh, we were rebuilding who BBH was in the U.S. of A. And the amount of awards that we won over the over the two years that I was CEO was staggering. It was staggering. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of it was the amount of positive noise and momentum yeah. that we needed to really continue to ride that wave and you know the conversation we had earlier about the web if you bbh as an example was here in the states we were really known for our film work for doing big right. amazing film work i mean heck bbh new york launched dear sophie for google chrome i mean that body of work kind of still resonates today. So when I became CEO, um, we really wanted to diversify our offering and we didn't want to be just put in a box because that is limiting and we all know um, from a creative standpoint, but also from a business standpoint. And so right. we, we wanted to take on projects that got us into digital and social and experiential. And so um, we really took our clients into that area, broadening our reach. And we won, you know, several webbies around that work, which really kind of set that tone and tenor for us and broke us out of that box that we had found ourselves in. So yeah. it really can it really can add to your bottom line, but also to your creativity. Yes, it it I remember I was lucky enough to work um at Ogilvy at a period when we were winning tons of awards and it it galvanizes all the people in the company as well so much uh like the the energy you get from it and and the it it's yeah i mean you, you, you it's 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 yeah it's such a lovely thing if you can do it um and 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 i agree i think it's sort of nice to to sort of as, a, as another sort of way to target and it also helps individuals within the agency and their own career absolutely. so much you get absolutely um, so um yeah i mean we're Every <laughs> so and to lots of can lions <laughs> this this message is sponsored by can lions um but but, <laughs> but but just to um to sort of try and try and round it out i mean what what are your what are, what are you up to next have you have any clue of uh, what the next i mean you know this is uh this is a big question maybe we need to just come and revisit this in uh, in a few months time but uh, so you, you're about to head off to Dubai. You're about to judge yeah. uh, Grand Prix for good, entertainment uh, for music. Uh, yeah, just entertainment. And I'm, well, I hope you have the most marvelous time in Dubai. Um, oh, well, uh, I'm well, thank you. Jealous. I mean, we could talk forever. This was yeah. such a great like conversation. Um, as far as what I'm doing next, it will be revealed very soon. Um, so I'd yeah. love to come back and talk about yeah. that. But in the meantime, yeah, I am off to Dubai in, gosh, a week or so. And I'm nice. just so excited. It's my first time in the region. And I'm so excited to, like, meet everyone and meet the jury. And so there's nothing yeah. better than judging in person. It really no, is a matter. But also, I'm in intrigued to know what you find about some of the cultural nuances, you know, the yeah. work from, from a particular region. Um I'm sure that's going to be a fascinating time. But uh, look, thank you so much. I I think I get so much from 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 your uh, from your chats, and I think that I love the message of fearlessness. Um, I I love the tenacity and the hard work that you put into everything, and just your general good natured spirit. And no wonder oh. you've got so many musicians who are now your your best friends too. And I'm sure that. Your dad must uh, be looking down and in, being incredibly proud of you uh, to, to be such a fantastic human and, and done so much and good in, in the music industry as well. Um, so bra bravo on, on being you and, and huge love. I look forward to chatting again soon. Good morning. And thank, you. thank you for your generosity of spirit. Thank you for having me on the show. We will talk soon.